strategy, design, marketing, UX, digital, development. This is Agencies That Build, the show dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Casey. I'm a former coder and agency owner. And I'm Maroon, a better coder and an agency partner. Better? <laughs> Probably true. This show is sponsored by Galaxy. On a mission to help agencies grow. There it is. It's live. We're recording. And man, the guest today is fantastic. I can't wait to introduce you to him. The internet is in his blood. He actually grew up. He grew up snuggling every night with his hands on a keyboard and they have never left. Uh, built his first website at 12. Now he's a thought leader in the space. Story brand certified guide. Host of his own podcast, Building a Business That Lasts. CEO at Design Extensions, Jay Owen. Welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Man, you are a busy guy. I am, but you know, there's a lot to do in life, so <laughs> might as well take advantage of it. Yeah, let's do it, man. So let, let's get into this. This is the Digital Leadership Series. I'm excited to have you on here, and I need to pass you something real quick. It's kind of heavy, but I think you, I think you got this. Ugh. Okay, here you go. You got it? Thor's hammer? I feel like I need one of those in here Grab it. There you go. Two-handed. Nice. That's nice and safe. Safe move. All right. Take Thor's hammer. I know. You need one just to smash the wall. Uh -huh. Take that hammer and smash for me some kind of myth, bogus strategy, misconception. Set the record straight once and for all. Oh, man. There's so many. I think especially in, in agency life or client services in general, um, there's two that come to mind, but I'll hit you with the first one. The first one is you don't have to work 100 hours a week to be successful. Um, you know, I, I think one of my biggest frustrations right now in, in the world is we just seem to be operating in so many extremes. We don't need to get into some of those extremes, but there just seems to be this like falling off of the cliff of one side or the other. And yeah. I think that happens with work. You know, there's guys like Elon Musk uh, or, who say like, you know, if you're not working 100 hours a week, you're barely even working or even Gary Vaynerchuk in that kind of hustle mentality of like 24 seven, you know, work before the sun gets up and after the sun goes down. Yeah. And and, and it, I think it just portrays a false reality of what it has to be like in order to grow. And I think the opposite is true. You can fall off the opposite side of the cliff too, which is the other side of the world says, well, if you're not taking two naps during the day and doing at least three yoga classes before lunch, then you're not resting enough either. And that's not true either. And yeah. I think ultimately what it comes down to is you have to find where you need to be for your season of life. And that's going to vary throughout your lifetime, depending on where you're at. I'm sure mine will continue to change as my life changes through the years. Um, but I think those seasons of life matter a lot and, and where you're at, whether you're married or not, whether you have kids or not, what season your business is in. Is it just in startup phase? Has it been around for a few years? All those things affect how many hours you really need to work. But at some point, if you've been in business for a long time, years, and you're still telling yourself you have to work that many hours, that is not true. Busted, man. That myth is busted. Why, why do we have this misconception? Is it just because we see some, some people at the extremes that are kind of cool? I mean, let's be honest, Gary V, Elon Musk, these are some cool people, but they're, yeah, making, they they're making a choice. And yeah, they are. And, have to, but here's the thing about, here's the thing about, I don't know about Elon, but Gary for sure, he would make the argument that like, look, he, he, this is what he does. But what happens is people, people idealize that and say that's how it has to be in order to see success. Gotcha. Um, and I think... I think especially in America, we, um, what's the thing people love to say the most when they say, hey, how you doing? The most common response, well, I don't know about 2020, but prior to now was, well, you know, I'm really busy. Matter of fact, you even let it off by saying you're a really busy guy. I that's did. A tr that's a trophy that people carry around and, and they go, look how busy I am. And I'm like, mm. I don't know how busy I want to be. I'd like to be really productive, but busy doesn't sound very fun. That's so, true. It's something to think about. Yeah, the idea of the busy versus the productive. I, I remember, you know, a common phrase in the Marine Corps was like, work smarter, not harder. Or sometimes yeah. we would say, work harder, not smarter. We were doing something just completely <laughs> idiotic. And we're like, right. what are we doing, guys? But yeah, I mean, the idea of the quantity is not as important as necessarily the result. Right, absolutely. There's no question about it. So how, how do you shift over into that? I, I mean, if you find yourself, someone listening to this finds themselves like, okay, I'm clearly in that camp. Elon would be happy. I'm doing 200 hours a week and I'm going insane. Um, or, or the opposite. It sounds like we need to find that middle ground. How do you get there? 
You know, I think you have to just decide where you want to go first. And that sounds so simple, but at the same time, you need to decide where you want to go and you need to write it down. People say these things all the time, but the problem is most people don't actually do them. And I've found that when I physically write that, I go, hey, what do I want my life to look like a year from now? What do I want it to look like three years from now? What's my 10-year vision of a future? And then ask the question, this is one of the most powerful questions I've ever been given, what needs to be true today for that to be true tomorrow? And and I think that's it. Like you have to add what needs to change. I remember back in the day, early on in business, I had not taken a, a legitimate vacation in years. I mean, I just, if I was on vacation, heavy air quotes, I was really attached to my phone or laptop or I needed to be near the internet. I always felt like I had to be available for the business. And the truth was at that time, the business was not structured well enough. And so I did actually have to do that if I wanted it to survive. Yeah. Um, and I started to go, hold on, this is not good enough. There has to be a better way. I know there's a better way because there are other people who do this better than I'm doing it. So how can I follow them? So find good mentors, find other people that you can lean on and go, hey, that person seems to have it figured out, although half of us are lying on the internet anyway, but um, <laughs> that person seems to have it figured out. So how can I move towards that? And for me, the first goal was just to take a long weekend off. So I asked the question, what needs to be true in order for me to take, you know, a Friday through an end of a Monday and not check my email or my phone. What needs to be true for that to happen? And, and then I said, well, that worked pretty well. And what do you get? What, what are the things that come up from that? You got to make sure the team is not hitting you up. Well, you that, gotta, at what? that point, I mean, gosh, that early on, I didn't really have a team. It was me plus a bunch of contractors. Yeah. So I had to have some systems in place, some automation. Eventually I had to hire an actual, you know, employee uh, at some point that wasn't just a contractor. Um, and, and so, then I kind of extended that. So what, now what does a week look like? Now what does two right. weeks look like? Yeah. And this year, which is to be fair, 21 years in, this didn't happen overnight. People are like, oh, you're an overnight success. I'm like, yeah, I busted my <laughs> tail for two decades and now I'm an overnight success. Um, this year was really special because my goal was to take a full 30 days off. Wow. Um, now that was the idea before the pandemic. <laughs> 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 so, you know, everything started to kind of shift a little bit, but we did it anyway. We ended up selling our house because um, we we're working on a new one and we decided to take a 30 day family RV trip around the country. First two weeks, I did not work at all. I didn't check a single message. I didn't take a single phone call. I didn't uh, reply to my email or even look at my email. I've also found I can't look at my email. I actually have to turn it, disable it from my phone because when I see it, I feel like I have to do something with it, even if I really don't. And so that is a mental thing for me. I know another guy who went so extreme. He actually had his office admin change the password to his Smart. email so he couldn't right. check his own email without calling her and having to, to admit that he needed to get into it. <laughs> um, and I thought that, you know, if that's what you have to do, you have to put boundaries in place to protect your own sanity. Otherwise, you're going to end up in a spot where you're worn out, stressed out, and ready to quit. And this summer, being able to take those 30 days was amazing. I mean, my kids yeah. aged from 7 to 15. We spent 30 days on the road. We did 11 national parks, 22 states, and drove 8,000 miles in those 30 days. And those are memories that they will have until they die. Like wow. that, that has so much value, so much more value than any amount of money that I could have made this year. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And, and you recharged your batteries. So I'm sure by the time you got back to it, you were just oh, yeah. chomping at the bit to get at it. Like, and you want like growth comes from that, you know, whether Absolutely. you're on a team or running a team, like you're supercharged at that point, man, you're ready. Man, I, I used to really believe, and some people still believe this and they're wrong. I used to believe that growth was like for pansies. I mean, not growth, <laughs> rest. I used to believe that uh, rest was for like, rest was for pansies. Like you didn't need to rest. Like you just got to hustle, you know, you got to get the job done. And there's a lot of that being proclaimed now. Yeah. I mean, that's just so foolish. Some of what my, is it like rest when you're dead? Is that, is yeah, that what it is? Yeah, exactly. That's the same. Sleep I hate you're that dead? garbage. I love to sleep. I need to sleep. I need a solid eight hours of sleep every single night. That's what I need. I, I can't operate on four. I'm not one of those people. Now, some people don't maybe need physically as much sleep, but the science is clear on this. We need rest. And, and we know this is true as, as it relates to our brains, because when do we come up with our best ideas? We do it when we're, uh, in the shower, when we're yeah. driving in the car, maybe right after we wake up or right before we go to sleep. And the reason that happens is because our brains need that extra free space. Mm -hmm. And there's real science behind this. I don't know the real science. I just know how it works in practical life. When our brains have that free space, magic happens because our brains come up with things that we wouldn't have otherwise. That's where real powerful brainstorming actually occurs. Not when you sit down and go, all right, let's brainstorm right now. It usually comes when you actually have rest. I mean, the number of things that I kind of came up with and put together on this RV trip, even though it wasn't working, the ideas still roll around, especially when you're driving 8,000 miles around the country. Yeah. Um, 
one of my best ideas from last year legitimately came from after a Sunday afternoon nap. I came home from church. I was exhausted. We probably had some lunch, watched a little football, fell asleep on the couch. When I woke up, I was like, you know, I got this idea. And I immediately, here's, here's the key difference here between having an idea and doing something about it. I immediately picked up a pencil or a pen and I picked up a piece of paper and I started writing down what that idea was. And so what's the next first step that I have to take after that? Now that became this monthly workshop that we used to do live and in person. And now we do digital. Um, it became a monthly workshop we did here at the office that generated hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales last year. And that came from after a nap. Jeez. Pretty good. What kind of a workshop is it? Uh, I teach like a marketing and messaging workshop. So a lot of the fundamentals I might normally teach from stage at a keynote or something like that. We do it with a smaller group. So we'll bring nice. in 15 to 20 people here in our office. Well, we used to, we're, we're going to start that back as soon as things get cleared up and everybody feels safe. Um, but it was great because one, I got to have a low cost item, which is really mm -hmm. valuable. And a lot of big agencies don't have a low cost item because we're, can be expensive, you know, services. So I had a low cost item, which I love because it allowed me to help more people. Number one, yeah. and that's my job. And number two of the people that did come uh, at least a couple of them in that group, uh, some of the many people there might not, have been a client for us because we're not at a stage where they can justify the expense of a full agency. Um, but I was able to help them anyway. And then a couple of them were potential clients and the upsell possibility out of something like that is, is substantial. And I just believe in hitting the ground running. Well, what's the next thing? I literally sold out the first workshop before I'd even developed the curriculum that we were going to teach at it. Jeez. And, uh, and next year, actually March, the end of March next year, uh, we're going to be doing a live event here in St. Augustine for two days it's going to be called Business Business Builders Live. And uh, we're actually about to launch that landing page. By the time people watch this, they may, it may already be live. But um, it's going to be called Business Builders Live. We're going to spend two days teaching the business growth framework that I've put together. Um, I'm really excited about that. That's kind of like the culmination yeah. of those workshops. We spent a year teaching the, the three-hour workshops. Now we're going to do a two-day event. It's going to be a blast. That's amazing. Is it in Florida too, St. Augustine? Yeah, that's exactly. We, we looked around and we thought, wow, we live in a, the nation's oldest city. It's a beautiful historic town yeah. with a beautiful uh, bayfront, uh, you know, it's 450 years old, plus uh, beautiful beaches. So we're like, why don't we use our location to an advantage? Let people come to us. We'll do a workshop and let them enjoy a nice, you know, week in uh, beautiful, sunny Florida. Man, I'm, I'm already sold. It's like, I, I don't even need to <laughs> Um, Great. I'll see you there. You no, know, seriously. Uh, get, get, yeah. After being cooped up, man. Yeah, exactly. That's my great, thought too. Is people are by, by, Mar by the end of March next year, Lord willing, this thing will be, you know, as cleared through as it's probably ever going to be at that point. Right. And, and people are going to be, have been so cooped up. They're going to need a break. Tell and so me I'm going to give them two things. I'm going to give them two days full of business knowledge. And then I'm going to uh, turn them loose to the city with some s recommendations and turn them loose to our beautiful uh, beaches. Uh, I, I feel an expense coming on. <laughs> like, so you said business build, uh, biz builders live.com business builders live is, is, is it. Yep. Okay, cool. We'll put a link in the show notes too, for people who want to want to hang out with uh, Casey, right? Hang out with Jay <laughs> in Augustine. Let's do this. That's right. um, that man, that's, that is, it's, it's so cool. A couple things come to mind. Actually, you mentioned the low cost item. Just wanted to quickly ask you about that because I know a lot of, you know, Agency talk is well, you know. Do you do the low cost item? Is it or is it a, is a is like a? Do you lose money on it? But Jimmy get some clients. Is it a what do they call that? A loss leader? You know, is yeah. it is it that? But to your point, you help more people out. How how do you how do you balance that? Having done this for so long, the, the you know the small project versus trying to get those whales in. So I think you have to be really careful because there's difference there's a difference in production work that's low cost low value and knowledge work. So the workshop is what I would call knowledge work. And, and the difference is I'm going to show up, I'm going to teach some material and people are going to leave and we're going to be done. Um, and they learned something. They had, they got value from being there. I shared some information that was valuable. I had a platform that I created for myself in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't have a ton of embedded time and there's very, really no cost. I mean, there's some cost with setup and stuff, but it's minimal, right? So we only charged for that live event, $79 per person. Um, this is this three hour workshop and we always filled it up every month and it was great. Um, that works really well as an initial product offering. I think it can work online too. It's, I think it's right now, especially it's harder to charge for stuff like that. Yeah. That's the beauty of an in-person event. People will almost always pay for it. And the, the reason it, it mattered to charge something for it versus making it a free workshop, because that was an option too, obviously, yeah. is... Um, you know, people, 
when they pay for something, they're more likely to take it seriously. Yes. So if you've got a workshop this evening that was free that you signed up for and you've had a long day and it's five o'clock, you're like, nah, I'm just going to skip it. Right. Totally. But if you paid, but if you paid 80 bucks for it, you're like, you know what? I got a ticket. I paid 80 bucks for it. I probably should go. Right. So you, you just do it. And, and there's just some psychology to, to why that works. And then there's a great upsell opportunity because while I am spending three hours teaching to that group, I also am um, establishing myself as a subject matter expert for three hours. And so it's mm. not a three hour sales pitch by any means, but really good sales is just building relationship. And that's there's cool. very few things that are better building relationship than being able to teach somebody else something that's actually going to give them value. And that was the big thing for me is I didn't care. That's not true. I want people to buy more stuff from us for sure. But if people weren't in a place to buy from us, I don't really want them to, because it means we can't really help them. Right. And, and I want them to leave and go, Hey, this was a valuable use of my time today. Um, so that's where I think that the low cost item can work really well. Um, it's no different than like a webinar, you know, I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of what a webinar is to some extent. Um, I like being able to charge something for it though, even if it's just a small amount, not, but not because of the revenue. Um, although, you know, 20 people times 79 bucks, that's a pretty good evening, uh, for just standing <laughs> around talking. Um, but what's interesting about that is I think over the course of the year, we maybe made, I don't know, 15 ish grand off of ticket sales for that yeah. event. Um, but we, we made hundreds of thousands of dollars off the upsells and that's where the magic is, which is the true, I mean, it's the same model for, um, for things like webinars and stuff too. Yeah. I could see that, you know, it, it, people do ascribe that value of it, any kind of charge, you know, when you have a free event. I mean, I'll routinely see like 50%, you know, will show up yeah, or less, that's right. you know, because yeah. it's free and yeah. people have stuff and they just sign up for it to get the recording, you know, and when it's virtual. And, and it's also, that's right, which is fine because that's can be a good lead gen yeah. tool as well. But when they're paying for it, the other thing about it is even um, like something like my book, for example, is a low cost offer as well. So yeah. that's a very that's low a cost uh, it's the same as my podcast, which is building a business that lasts. So we kind of do the click funnels, you know, free plus shipping thing on that book. Um, and it's a great way to just get somebody to sign up. They're interested in the material. They may or may not be a good client, but at least we can kind of get them in our ecosystem. And, and what, you know, Russell Brunson from click funnels always talks about is the best person is going to be likely to give you more money as somebody who gave you some money in the first place. And so if, even if they just gave you a dollar or $8 for shipping and handling or $80 for a workshop, that person is significantly more likely to then buy something else from you in the future than somebody who just signed up for something for free. So even though the, the conversion rates up front on somebody paying is going to be lower than somebody signing up for a free event, the post event conversion is going to be much higher because they're going to more, be more likely to give you more money ultimately. Um, makes sense, man. I'm, I'm, I'm on building a business that lasts and, uh, um, uh, First of all, it's, it's frigging designed like beautifully. <laughs> Thanks. It and helps I'm when like, you run a design agency. You know, I know, right? Well, you know how they say like, <laughs> I'm lost in your eyes. I'm lost in like the design of your site. You know, I'm like nerding uh, out. I'm like, wow, that looks really good. Um, got it. So you charge for a little bit and you, you mentioned, I really love this quote, you know, really good sales is building relationship, you know, and yeah. you establish that trust. It's not even rapport. It's trust. It's kind of trust this person. It is. And there's nothing people, like- People buy things like, from people they know, like, and trust. Yeah. And true. you're like, I'm not trying to necessarily get new business, but I am from this thing, but I want them to get value out of this presentation. So putting that first, people can sense that they're like, Oh, they're just trying to like right now, we're just doing this thing. We're not really selling anything. We're just right. having a conversation. We're here to help people learn. And, and that really can help build the trust too. And I can see that um, being really powerful. Can you com contrast that now with like the production small pro Cause you've got the knowledge work for, versus the production. Um, so are we saying it's okay yeah, yeah, yeah. all knowledge work thing, but on the production side, that's where you got to watch out? I think you just have to be careful. Um, yeah. It's easy to end up in situations, especially as you grow an agency. It's one thing if you're like running super solo, you know, and you're flying loose by yourself and you want to do a quick side project for 500 yeah. bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever, and you know, it's just your time and you're happy to do it. That's a totally different ball game than once you start to establish a team. And as long as you know your margins, it's fine. I mean, we, we operated in some, what I would consider to be lower cost spaces for a long time, as far as website builds, um, but over time, as, as we've continued to increase the quality and the team size, I've realized like we just can't, we can't sell things at that price point that like the solopreneur web designer can do. Yeah. Because it just doesn't make sense for us. And, and ultimately it comes down to value as well, right? Like we, we should be providing a certain level of value to somebody else 
um, because we don't bill hourly almost ever. So yeah. um, we do sometimes on some development projects, but like design, web, marketing is all essentially value priced um, or at least fixed price projects. And, and I think that's kind of been a big thing for me because you just have to know your numbers. Um, and if you don't know what those margins are, you can be bleeding in one area of the company financially and not really knowing it. And I've done that before. And it, it's not good when you realize that you're like, holy smoke, we're doing this whole thing over here and it's causing a lot of time and stress and we're literally paying to do it. That's not good. Yeah. <laughs> and that you'd be surprised often that happens. I mean, it's happened to me for sure. Yeah. I definitely remember seeing a spreadsheet one time with different product offerings that, that my team had. And, and the thing that usually was the bigger deal size for us at the time, these migrations, whatnot. I remember seeing some number. Eventually we corrected the data a little bit, but for a while it was just like negative 1000 or some <laughs> right. like, Whoa, <laughs> let's, let's investigate this. That's not, it's like, the, it's like charity work. Like, what are we doing? Like, why are we? But the um, same thing can happen on, the same thing can happen on bigger projects. The, you yeah. know, I remember as, as I was growing up in business, if you will, um, my first project that was like, you, you always hit these milestones, especially when you start out as young as I did, like early on, like $500 was a big deal. Then a thousand dollars was a big deal. Then five was a big deal. Then 20 was a big deal. I remember 20 specifically because the first time I sold a project that was worth, uh, it was $20,000 to the client. That project, once I went back and did the math, ended up costing me about 25. Oh, uh, that's not good. So that I was learned a valuable time? lesson there. Or well, was it? no, it was other, it was contractors it, as well. Oh gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I ended up really burning myself on that. It wasn't just about my time investment because that's a totally different um, ball game. It was about actual hard expenses, cost of goods sold, if you will, externally. And um, so you can burn yourself on either end. You can, there's plenty of big projects where people end up, if their scope is not well-defined, the details aren't there, gosh, you can really burn yourself there too. So going back to the original question, which was about like, is it okay to do low priced project work. I think sure it is. You just have to know what your numbers are and you got to be careful and uh, don't just wing it. Um, at least not for too long. Yeah. Yeah. Be, yeah. Be careful. Be not being, being intentional. It sounds like all the topics here, be intentional about taking that project just to take a step back and do, I really want that same thing with being intentional for your time and having that rest time and that recharge mm -hmm. time. Um, it, now is this, it was this like a key part cause I, your book uh, I know it starts out with building a business at last. And I, uh, you know, I, I looked up, I got lost in, you know, your eyes and your design. It was like <laughs> without sacrificing your family. Right. Was yeah. a, it's a key yeah, part that's of a that. big deal for me. So like a lot of, the, a lot of the, in my podcast uh, on building a business at last, the podcast version, I always ask the question at the end about um, what does work-life balance mean to you? Oh, nice. And how has that changed through different seasons of your life? Because, you know, for me, uh, I, I love the work that I do. I could work from the time I wake up until the time I go to sleep and I would probably be fine. Like I, I really like the vast majority. I'd find something to do. I like being in front of a computer. I could sit in front of a computer all day long. Yeah. I, I, people often think I'm an extrovert on the stage, but you put me in a room with a computer all day, I'm good to go. I, I could find some stuff that I need to get done and it'll be fun. I'll end up writing another book or something. Sure. Um, but along the way, you know, seasons of life change. And, mm -hmm. you know, I got married pretty young. We had kids pretty young and now I have five kids. Um, and you know, they always say like they grow up fast, um, but they really do like mm. all of a sudden, you know, my, my oldest is 15. He's almost 16. Now he's starting to drive, uh, which is terrifying. Actually, he'll be a better driver than me probably. You think so? Um, yeah, he's super conscientious. And oh, that's cool. <laughs> about the rules. So he's, a, he's a great kid, but you know, he's almost 16 now. I have two summers left with that kid. Yeah. Two. So like if I had not positioned my business in a place where I could take that RV trip this year, like it probably would never happen with him, you know? And, and I'm not saying everybody has to do an RV trip, like do whatever you want, do whatever works for you and your family. Um, but for me, my family is really important to me. You know, I want to be married to the same woman my whole life. And I know a lot of people end up in situations where that doesn't work out for tons of different reasons. But for me, that's a big objective for me. I got mm -hmm. to meet uh, Lou Holtz, the famous college uh, football coach. Wow. One time. And uh, at an event and he, uh, I said, Lou, I respect a lot of the things that you've done. The thing I respect the most, which at the time, uh, he'd been married 47 years. I said, you've been yes. married 47 years. And he, he laughed. He said, well, Jay, I've just found it's cheaper to keep her. And if you can't break <laughs> up, you might as well make up. And I'm like, that's pretty sound advice. I like that. Man, and then I love just that. Totally right. Side tangent while well, I'm talking about Lou, because he's such a cool guy. I love hearing from old, wise people. There's so much value in that. 
he was at an event uh, that I was at actually earlier this year. And um, he was on stage and he said, uh, he was talking about his wife, who he'd been mar married to for 49 years. Wow. And he said, uh, she passed away and we buried her last week. That's what wow. he said from stage in person. And he said, and everybody said to me, Lou, you don't have to go to this event. You don't have to go talk. Like, and he said, uh, well, she would have told me if I can help them, I should go. And so here I am. And I was like, you know, yeah. like that's an icon, you know, like that's a, yeah. that's a legend to me, not just because of the things that he's done, but because of how he's cared for the people around him. You don't stay married to the same person for 49 years without some serious intentionality by both people. And that is highly respectable to me. And I, and I want kids who grow up and are well-adjusted. So another one of my kind of role models or people I really love to look up to is a guy named Michael Hyatt. Um, yep. He's got five grown children who all seem to like him at least well enough to take a picture with him still. And his wife is his, I'm mean, not his wife, his uh, oldest daughter is his COO essentially. Jeez. And um, he's been married, same thing, married to the same woman for, I don't know, 40 something years. And I think it's, it's more, it's about more than money to me right? Mm -hmm. Money's great. Like, let's not lie. Like people say money can't buy happiness. I hung a 82 inch 4k TV in our media room last night. And I was <laughs> laughing with my son and I was like, no, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty happy right now. Right. Turns out money can at least buy a little bit of that. And that's true actually, but you also need to be able to have that time mm -hmm. to sit next to that 15 year old and fire up that Xbox and have that conversation and make that joke because it would have been easy for me to still be at the office and go, you know what? I can make a little bit more. I'd close yeah. one more deal. I can make a little bit more. And there's always more to be made. There's yeah. always more to happen. But there's a season where you get to a point where you go, hold on, what's the total value of my life? And that's why I put that line in there about building a business that lasts without sacrificing family. Because to me, that's the hard part. Building a business that lasts is not that complicated to me. I, I, I can make a business run, especially if it's just me and a couple of other people. Shoot, I'll run that thing forever. Be fine. Um, I'll find a way. I'm scrappy enough to figure it out. But to do that and care for the other people around me well, that's hard work. And that requires intentionality and it requires focus. And man, I mess it up uh, plenty of times. But, but, but putting that in writing holds me accountable to it. And it, yeah. it kind of sets that standard. There is something about putting down a paper. You keep putting it down on paper and then it just makes it much, like even just an inch, you know, a millimeter of ink more yes. real than it it's was amazing. two seconds ago in your brain. Yeah. The, I, and it's funny because as much as I love the computer and digital stuff, I think there is something like visceral about taking a pen or a pencil and putting it on a physical piece of paper. Yeah. There's just something about that that ha happens with our brain. I'm sure there's some real science about that somewhere. I just don't know what it is. Right. And, uh, but I do think it has impact and creates power. Well, it's not a science show. So we just throw out the facts, you know. That's right. Make, we just make stuff up. And I'll just know, say it's science. People believe that it is. 97% of people <laughs> write things right. down. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sure there's a study somewhere that will back me up. I just have to Google it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look in the show notes to see the link directly to the That's right. producer. It's called confirmation bias. You'll find yeah, what you believe. Right. Well, you know, I think caring is important. Um, I made it a core value at my agency, just idea about caring about the team, but also the, the customer. Can you talk mm. to me about, there's, a, there's a, that age old, I don't know if an acronym is the right word for it, but I'm pulling out of nowhere. The idea of the customer is always right. You know, and <laughs> you care about them. But it's, I don't know, is that oh, caring? Man. I don't know. No, it's not. It, it can be enabling. You know, the customer yeah. is not always right. In fact, nobody's always right. I'm right. not always right. You know, my team's not always right. And the customer, sure as heck, is not always right. They're just not. And, and, and ultimately, they hired you for a reason. Because you know how to do things that they don't know how to do. Or you know how to do things that they don't want to do. Right. And so at some point... You have to decide if you're, if you're leading that client towards better success or if you're just doing what they tell you to do. Both are actually acceptable jobs. There's nothing wrong with having a business that just does what people tell them to do. That's, there's nothing wrong with that, just to be right. clear. But you need to know that that's intentionally what you want to be. I used to be that. People would come to me and they'd say, hey, Jay, we want to build a website. And I'd say, great. What do you want to put on it? And they go, well, here's some text and here's some photos and maybe a video. Well, back then we didn't do videos, but you know, they have some stuff and I'll, you got a logo. Yeah, we got a logo. All right, great. Give me that. And, and we'll put it together and there's your website. Right? right. And that was fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's what even some people need today. Some people don't need much more than that. But now people come to me and they say, Hey Jay, we need a website. And I go, well, why? And they're like, well, don't you build websites? I'm like, well, yeah, we do. I'm just asking why you need a website. I'm like, well, everybody has to have a website. Well, why do you need a website? 
Well, yeah. because we need to uh, tell people about our business. Well, why need to do that? And it gets a little bit obnoxious when you start to do that, but it's really helpful because, because it helps root to like, what are we trying to accomplish here? Yeah. And then when we get to their messaging, like clients are not expert copywriters. They're not. Most people on my team aren't even expert copywriters. I have expert copywriters, but most people are not. And so yeah. most people don't even know how to talk about themselves. People used to come to me and they'd say, hey, Jay, we need your help to, build, to write a story about our company. I'd be like, great, well, tell me about it. And I'd make it sound better than whatever they told me. Now they say, hey, Jay, same thing. We need your help to tell our story. And I say, no, you don't. You need my help to invite your customer into a story. That's, mm. a, very different, that's a very different thing. Most people's marketing should be a message about about the customer and what they want and what problem we're trying to help them overcome, not about us as a company and how great we are and how many years we've been in business and anything else. It's almost irrelevant if we haven't yeah. first addressed what the customer's problem is. And so when a client comes to us and they go, hey, we want to change this, I shouldn't just inherently believe that they're right. I should ask, why do they want to change it? What are they trying to accomplish? What's the end goal we're trying to reach towards here? And they may say, look, I don't need to worry about that. I just need you to change it. And I'm going to be mm -hmm. like, fine, you're paying the bill. I'll update it. That's what you really want. But that's not the company I really want to be. I want to be a strategic company that helps people figure out what they need to do in order to grow a business and then actually do it. Um, but there's nothing wrong with just being the one that's just doing the work either. Th those are both fully respectable jobs. Just know which one you want to be and move towards that. Right. Right. Powerful, man. And, and I, I've certainly had, um, clients asking for certain things. And I feel like, you know, it's not all roses, what we're saying here, right? Like if you, if no. you say no to a client or you try to keep them from walking off a cliff, they may not like you for it. You yeah. may lose the business for it, yeah. but they may come back. It's kind of like, I, I, I can I compare it to like advising like family, you know, like if your brother or sister is about to do something terrible and it's gonna mess up their life, it's like your job as yeah. the family, the person that cares about them to be like, no, don't. I know this may ruin our relationship, but I got to tell you, don't do, please, you know? And, mm -hmm. um, but I feel like the good ones respect that. And they'll, mm -hmm. they see like, oh, this is it's not a, a yes man or yes woman. They're like actually putting thought into, should we do this? Shouldn't we do this? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there are going to be times if you've been in business long enough that you're going to say something that's going to aggravate a client enough, that they're going to need to leave. And there's going to be times where you honestly you may need to tell a client they need to leave. Sure. Uh, some, sometimes we don't realize that that one client who may be paying us pretty well even, but they're just such a thorn in everybody's side that they're just not worth it. There is an opportunity cost. And what I mean by that, for people to know what that term means, it just means, you know, by dealing with one thing means I'm not doing something else. Like I'm choosing to be on this podcast right now. There's an opportunity cost to that. The opportunity cost is that for an hour or however long we're going to talk, I'm not doing something else, which could include resting. In fact, I'm not taking a nap this afternoon. I don't usually take naps anyway, but at some point I might in life. Um, and, 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 and so there's an opportunity cost and you have to ask when I'm dealing with this one client, what am I missing out on by doing that? Yeah. I could be doing a sales follow-up. I could be closing another client. I could be caring better for this client over here that's a better fit, that everybody likes. It's actually nice. That actually trusts us. That's why one of the things that we say when we talk about who an ideal client is, it's not just about um, what industry the company is. And that's actually nothing to do with who our ideal client is. But one of the pieces of that puzzle is that they trust us. Like we need people, especially if we're going to do a marketing campaign for somebody that trusts us. And not trust us to like turn results this week, but trust us with a long-term strategy that we're committed to their best interests. And if they trust that, they're a great client for us. Um, but along the way too, look, look, we all make mistakes, right? Like all of our businesses and agencies and services, we've all done things along the way that deserve losing trust. And, and yeah. I think that's important too, is I don't, what I don't want to do in, that, in this like segment of talking about the client's not always right is come off as this arrogant know-it-all, mm -hmm. um, which my personality can t tend towards sometimes <laughs> from an appearance perspective, at least, because in all relational situations, the, the primary problem with all client relationships, all team relationships, all, all relationships is misplaced expectations. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to happen. You think that's going to happen. Those two things are too far apart. We got a problem. And so clarifying those expectations up front are really a problem. And when things eventually do go south somewhere along the way, because they always do, um, they don't always go south. I'm just saying at some point there will be something that will go south. Um, is that you should always 
find the part that you actually could have improved because we all have at least 1% responsibility in all situations. Even if the other person like just seems totally at fault, mm -hmm. there's something we could have done to be a little bit better. And that's why I always say my biggest competition is not anybody that does work that I do. My biggest competition is me from last year. That's mm -hmm. the only guy I want to beat. That's the only guy I care about. All my competitors to me, we're just in a good place to collaborate. I, I mean, I, I've told you all kinds of things at the beginning of this podcast already that tons of people would not talk through because they're worried what their competition would like steal their ideas. I'm happy to give them away. I, I yeah. want to, I, I want to help other agencies uh, grow their businesses. I'm all about that idea yeah. because, because I think there's plenty of fish in the sea. I believe in abundance mentality. I, I believe that, that there's, there's more than enough opportunity for all of us. And so my greatest value is to, is to give and serve and care others for others. And if I do that, I just believe that's going to work out. And if it doesn't, I still did the right thing. So that's how my mind works. Man, I feel like you're like the agency whisperer. You, you <laughs> rename your podcast. Maybe that's, maybe but don't because the design is so good. That's just, right. <laughs> maybe it's a subtitle has been called the agency whisperer on multiple. Some podcasts. say, <laughs> some say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, I feel like I could talk to you all day, especially about um, like business challenges, agency challenges, but I want to, kind of even abundance mindset, man, we could go for 24 hours on that, on that. Oh, yeah, but for sure. I want to kind of transition, roll up the sleeves a little bit, talk about the actual building, the actual getting shit done, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. getting things to go from the design phase to the build phase. Real, like what, what makes a team effective at that creation, at that building part of the process? Well, gosh, that's a whole day's worth of an episode too. Sure, is that but, a workshop? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe, but, but just fundamentally, right? I mean, as you grow any company, but especially an agency, number one, you have the right people. Uh, you have the right people on your team for sure, which means you need to hire better. You need to take more time to hire. Most people hire way too quickly. Every hiring mistake I've made was because I pulled the trigger too fast and just trying to get somebody on the bus. Yeah. And it is much better to be patient and make sure you have the right person in the right seat. And that's another thing, like internally, you need to look around and go, hey, what does our structure need to look like? What roles do we actually need? If you're really small and you're, and you're starting out, maybe it's just you by yourself or you plus a couple of other people. One great way to do this is to literally write out all the job descriptions that you actually perform as a founder, owner, CEO, or whatever your role may be. Because chances are, if you're very small, you're, you're wearing about 15 hats. Most people know what that feels like. And write out what are those 15 hats. And then look at that and go, hey, um, of these things, which ones do I really love to do? And I'm really great at. Those are the ones yeah. you should try and keep. And the others, you should try and find people to fill. So you got to find the right people. Um, the other thing, which isn't, this isn't tactical, but it's in that people vein. I talk about this a lot. You need the right people around you as well, not just in your business, but around you. Mm -hmm. You need people that you're looking up to. You know, I mentioned earlier, I mentioned Lou Holtz and Michael Hyatt, right? Those aren't guys I necessarily personally have a relationship with, but I look up to them. The people, people I look up to, I want to be, be more like, what do I need to right. be, be more like these guys when I get older? You need people that are standing beside you. You need people that are peers that are walking through life together. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing today. We're just talking shop, just right? Talking. Peers walking through, walking through life. So you need somebody to look up to. You need somebody to stand beside you. I believe everybody needs somebody that looks up to them. I believe we should all be teaching something along yeah. the way because when we teach, we learn the most and we retain the most. So we have somebody to look up to, somebody to stand beside us and someone who's looking up to us. And then the last one is I think everybody needs somebody that believes in them when they don't believe in themselves. Maybe that's somebody in a mastermind group. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your best friend. Uh, maybe it's your mom. I don't know. Um, but you need somebody that believes in you when you don't believe in yourself. You got to have the right people around you. So that's, that's the first bucket. The, the second, as far as actual practical growth, is you need to have the right processes in place. Mm. I'm the typical like wing it entrepreneur from a young age. Same. I am not a process guy. I hate processes. I, I always thought they were corporate-y. I didn't think we needed them. Well, it turns out you can wing it to about 10 people in a million dollars. After that, if you don't have good processes in place, you're in for a world of hurt. Um, and so for us, uh, there's no point in reinventing the wheel on something like this. The process for us looks like uh, a system called EOS, uh, which is a, a book, uh, it's called Traction by a guy named Gino Wickman. 
And it just outlines some of the fundamental structural things around running a company that I didn't have any experience at. I quit college, so I didn't, uh, I didn't know how to do a lot of the businessy things. I just was winging it and figuring out how to make a dollar and help people in the process. Um, nice. So you got to have the right process. And then the really, yeah, you have to define what that product looks like. So regardless of what you're doing, especially when we talk about agencies specifically, there, that's a very broad term. There's a lot of different agencies. Some people are, run an agency and they just do logos. Some Seriously. people do an agency and they yeah. just do websites. Some people have an agency and they do all kinds of stuff, but not traditional media. Some people do all of it, you know? And so um, what is the product that you are actually really good at producing that provides real value for people that you're excited about selling? Right. Um, and, and then you got you to have a system in place to sell it. So that's kind of part of what I'm working on in this, in this new book that's going to kind of relate to this um, project, this live event that we're doing in March, is these four Ps of business. So, you know, one of the big things about uh, growth is having that system in place. We talked about having the right people, having the right process, having the right product. And, the, and then ultimately, the last one is promotion, you know, figuring out a mm. way to get attention and acquire customers. Because if you can't do that, none of the rest of it really matters. And so that's kind of the framework that I'm working on uh, a little behind the scenes for this new book, which is kind of taking the business, building a business that lasts idea of what I wrote in that book and really putting it in more of a, a system, a mm. framework, a process, um, and ironing out all the things I've learned since then. Cause you know, you write your first book and then you realize I could do, I could do a few things better. So I'm going to yeah. keep working on that. And, and that's kind of a lot of what we're going to teach at this event in late March next year too, is, is those four P's of profitability, people, process, product, and promotion that ultimately lead to profitability. It's a lot of P's, but, uh, it works out and, and it, uh, has been a huge kind of mind shift focus for me is where, where do we have areas that we need to work on. Let's focus yeah. on the area this quarter and, and work to improve that. Man, there's so much power in getting a framework. I found on my own, I realized that business, especially when you're small and you're growing, you spend a lot of time like learning to business. And yeah, you mentioned earlier, right. the opportunity cost, the opportunity cost is, well, you could be doing some billable work right now, but instead you're trying to figure out how to do this business thing, how to, how to do a one-on-one, -on -one, how to manage and scope a project and figure out client relations and operations and all these things. It's like, uh, if, the, and if there are already best practices, you can just like install in your company, right. just like as if it was like an app, it saves you all the time. How do meetings run? They run this way. Okay, great. That's the best way. Great. Let's not, right. let's not discover on our own the best way to optimize a meeting, you know? And that's what traction has been for us, you know, on the yeah. process side It's like, here's, here's how these things work. Just do them this way. And, yeah. you know, over time, I think you find ways to morph them to your business or, and I think it, initially it's best to just follow the system exactly as the system is designed. But if you've been doing it long enough, I mean, I literally have been in business for 21 years at some point you start to kind of go, all right, let's, let's adjust this over here for our culture, our people, our clients, our framework. And then yeah. you start to develop your own frameworks and your, your own processes. But initially it makes sense to just use what's out there because there's no point in reinventing the wheel, especially on things that aren't necessarily your strength. Um, most people, it's kind of like goes back to the, you know, if you're at E-Myth e by Michael Gerber, but in there he talks about Great this book. idea. Yeah, it's a classic. And he, yeah. he talks about this idea of, you know, this lady who, she bakes pies or makes cupcakes. I don't know. One of the, I think it's pies. And people are like, Hey, you make great pies. You make great cupcakes. You should start a cupcake business. And, and then she goes and does it. And then she realizes she's doing everything except what she actually wants to do, which is make cupcakes. And I think a lot right. of people end up in that scenario and you got to figure out which one of those hats do you ultimately wear? He, he kind of positions them as the, like the entrepreneur, the manager, and like the producer, the technician, artist, right? There's the like the artist, artist yeah, something and, like that. Yeah. That's right. And so like, which one of those do you want to be? No, none of them are right or wrong but you got to kind of figure that out. Yeah. And the idea of the artist that now has to be a, an accountant, you know, you right, have to be exactly. accounts payable and receivable. It's like, I, I just wanted to make cupcakes. I like my craft. That's How do right. I get back to that? It's, it's definitely a, a challenging hurdle. I feel like it's one of those hurdles you got to get through to, to be able to survive. Otherwise you, really you won't do. let go of the reins enough for your team to be able to take, take control. Question. You, you had mentioned you got to surround yourself with the right people. And I really like mm. the idea of the people above you to look at the people below you to support people next to you, people that encourage you. What mm -hmm. about partners? What about other teams? You know, how do you feel about working with other vendors? The, yeah. Even the idea of offshoring all those kind of concepts. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Um, True. I've never had an actual partner internally. So let's talk about what you're talking about, which is external partners. Yeah. It's a good call. Yeah. And, and ultimately, you know, 
none of us can do everything by ourselves, right? And if we could, it'd probably be a hard time to have a business at all because yeah. that's why people hire us. Right? People hire us to help them grow their business, to kind of be their marketing engine, their strategy engine, their content engine. And they're just taking that and putting it in their car and their car does all the other things where they may have somebody else that kind of comes in and is this other piece of the puzzle. Well, it's no different for us running agencies. We need other people to support us. I compare the work that we do a lot of times to the construction business hmm. uh, because you know, we just built a new house and I really saw this firsthand. It was interesting to be the, on the customer side of a very large project. Um, both pros and cons, because right. it made me think about my own business. And what a, what a builder does is they, they, they run the project. They, um, they do a lot of the actual work themselves. Sometimes they have people in, in house that do a lot of that work. Um, they help the client figure out what needs to happen. They make sure it stays on budget on time, make sure the client gets the final product that they actually need, want, and desire. But they bring in all kinds of people along the way because they need this special guy over here who's like a tile laying expert and he comes in and lays the tile and right. he's great at it. Or they have this other person over here who's really good at uh, a carpentry and craftsmanship. It doesn't make sense for them to have that person on their staff full time because they just right. need them occasionally when these particular types of projects come up. Um, and so they build relationships with those people. Mm -hmm. So a great builder in the construction space has all these great relationships. They got a great landscaper and a great cabinet guy and a great cleaner and a great, you know, carpet layer and whatever else, all these different things that they have while they still run their core business and have their own internal teams and everything else. Our, our life is no different than that. You know, I remember years ago, the first time I ever sent something overseas to be done, not, not somebody in the United States, um, it was wild. I just had different offers of people. We all get all these LinkedIn offers and email totally. offers and all this kind of stuff. And you never know who to trust. And this company was the one that actually eventually made me comfortable with the idea of working with people anywhere in the world is that they, um, they offered to do our first project without us giving them a deposit, which is insane. I would not recommend That's that in crazy, general, yeah. but they were willing to take that kind of risk because they were so confident what they could deliver. And they knew that the primary objection for somebody like me was I just never worked with somebody overseas. And so I didn't, wasn't comfortable with the idea. Yeah. And so they were willing to take that risk of building the project and not getting paid for it. But they were smart because they built the project and then I wanted the project because they did a good job on it. And the price was really good, way better than I could have done myself or uh, somebody hired somebody here to pull that off. So as a result, my client was able to get something better than maybe they could have normally afforded um, and everybody wins. Yeah. So yeah. this is a win-win situation. You know, I think offshoring specifically um, or outsourcing, which is the word people like kind of have made a dirty word at some points. I just don't understand that mentality because like, look, I love America and I'm, you know, thankful to have been born here and everything else. You know, sure. I might even bleed red, white, and blue. Same but, here, man. America. <laughs> that's right. But people are people no matter where they are. Yeah. And we have no problems as a, as a country or group of people. Well, most people have a problem with like humanitarian efforts of going into countries that need help and helping them. Sure. Well, what's the difference in providing jobs for people wherever they happen to be in order to help them help you yeah. and help your client? That makes a lot of sense to me. Sure. And especially in our global world now, I remember the first time I ever worked with a company, it was in India. And back then we didn't have like the easy payment types of options that, that exist today. Right. So for us to pay somebody overseas way back in the day, I had to go to the bank, yep. fill out a wire transfer. And it was like the first time I ever filled out a wire transfer too. I'm like, well, this is, I don't know what's going on here. You know, um, it takes like 20 minutes. Right. It was, and then you had to pay like $15 to do it. And all oh this God. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and now you just go online and hit a button and pff, it's all paid. Zap, zap, right. And so it's easier than ever. Um, and I just, as it relates to that, I think people are people and mm -hmm. you need, you need, um, partners uh, to support you. Uh, that's why people hire us. Like I said, people hire us so that we can be their marketing partner. That's why we call it a marketing partnership yeah. or app for application development. We're going to build an application to help their business grow um, as a, as a tool for them. Then um, they need us to be good partners. Well, we need good partners to help make all the other things happen. And it doesn't always make sense to have all those people in house. So I'm all for hiring Americans. I've hired plenty of them and I, I love being able to do that. But I'm also all for hiring people anywhere that they live in the world. If they're able to do a good job and the rate is right for the client and they're able to communicate well and all those kind of things, then who cares where they are? They're, people are people and they all need work. So let's find work for everybody as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, to your point, get it done. You know, yeah. get it out the door. That's and right. If, and, and I hear you though, like it, sometimes the challenge is like the trust side and 
You're there right. You, you get inundated with LinkedIn ad oh, requests yeah. saying from every country on the planet, you just like, I don't know who to work with. Like, that, that can be one of the challenges for sure. Well, we started just as an example of that that happened today. We started, have started um, publishing my podcast via video on YouTube. Nice. And I started putting together some YouTube videos. But I really haven't promoted the channel at all. So there's like, I don't know, 100 subscribers on there or something. Um, because we just haven't, but now it's starting to become a primary focus. So wow. yesterday, the day before, I just put something out on my LinkedIn and Facebook and everything. It's like, hey, you know, just so y'all know, for those of you who like to watch video instead of listen, we're publishing the podcast on YouTube now. Um, and I've got a ton of other Q&A videos on business growth that I've put together and and launched over there on YouTube. So go check them out. Gave them a link to go subscribe. Well, after I did that on LinkedIn, I literally had like 20 people, uh, like connection requests with notes wow. saying, hey, we, we help grow. Uh, no, this isn't good. This isn't good. Not we, a help good. People, like, wow, wow. we help people grow their YouTube channel. Just pay us X number of dollars and we'll oh, add a thousand geez. subscribers to your channel. I'm like, no, I want real subscribers, not fake subscribers. Right. And, um, and so there's a lot of that that happens. But I think building those good relationships um, regardless of where they are, is really, really important for long-term success and growth. Yeah, agreed, man. Well, my next question is like, who are you? Who are you? How, <laughs> how do you know all these things? Can you like take us back in time to like little J days? Did you always know you're going to be running a company and thought leader, workshops, uh, books, all this stuff? Um, no, no, I don't think I knew all <laughs> those things. I wish that I could say I had this grand vision from a very right. young age. But I was an entrepreneur from a very young age. I, I do think that some people can be made into entrepreneurs and can learn to become them. And I do actually believe that some people are kind of like made for it. I think mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill attribute that I do believe you can actually be born with. And I think that I was. I think I had this desire to kind of run my own thing, you know, um, and I had ideas that, that I was willing to put into practice that people would be willing to pay me for. And then I thought, well, this is exciting. They're happy. I'm happy and I'm getting paid. This is right. really good. So yeah. I started my very first business. I was eight years old um, and I was at a baseball field back before we had concession stands mm -hmm. and at least not at this field. And I thought, man, these people uh, could use some drinks and snacks because I want drinks and snacks. So what if we sold them to them? And so my mom literally took me to Sam's Club or Costco, whatever it was, sure. Sam's Club actually. At the time, we bought some drinks and snacks and I filled up a little red wagon and I rolled around that ball field and sold uh, concessions. Now today, you'd probably need like a permit and all this other <laughs> stuff to do it. But back then you didn't. And, and it was great. And then when I was 12, I started a lawn business for the first time actually. Um, and I, was, I came up with an acronym. It was the first flyer I ever designed. I can remember it now. I had like this hideous house. It was all black and white. I had a little lawnmower on it. And down the side, it said J action yard service, J A Y S. And, uh, and so I ran that lawn business for a while and it was great. Um, when I was 12 was also the time I built my first website. I'm a nerd or a geek at heart and, wow. um, and just playing around, you know, um, did you use an and, app for that? Was it like on a geo cities kind of thing or was that, uh, just that was, we did some geo cities for sure. Back in the day. It's funny, actually, HTML. I remember like making websites on geo cities before I knew even knew HTML and, um, and not knowing even how to set up a domain name. Like that yeah. was, now that's so normal for us because we do that kind of stuff every single day. But back then it was like mystery science, you know? Yeah. And it was just fun. And I just enjoyed it. It was more of a hobby than anything. And I played around with a few things here or there. I was fortunate when I was 16, I was uh, given an internship uh, at a company in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, here where we live and uh, over the summer. And uh, it was better than bagging groceries. I got to go make websites yeah. and learn from other people who did as a real job. And I thought, this is pretty cool. And um, when that company got bought out and a few other things, that internship turned into like a little job. They gave me a computer to take home. I guess they figured, no, let's pay this kid $9 an hour to work from home. It's pretty good. Um, and I learned a lot from those people uh, then. Yeah. And then when I was 17, uh, I was at a friend's house and his dad worked in IT and we saw a proposal sitting on the counter and it was for like a web project of some sort. And it was for $20,000. Now $20,000 is a lot of money today. Uh, for me, uh, it's 20, 20 grand is great for anybody. Right. But at the time, as a 17-year-old, that's like, I might as well have been a million dollars. I thought, mm -hmm. whoa, people pay people $20,000 to build up a website? What's going on here? I can mm -hmm. do this. And that was the year I started my business. Um, so Design Extensions was founded in 1999. I was 17 years old. I was a junior in high school. And we made about $5,500 the first year. Um, not much, but enough to pay for uh, gas in my car and movies on the weekend. And that's all I really needed or wanted. And it just grew little by little, year over year. A uh, little more revenue, a little more profit every single year. Uh, we've done that for 21 years in a row now. And that little business that made $5,000 the first year is now a multi-million dollar agency. Um, 
with a team of about 20 here in St. Augustine, uh, Florida, along with uh, contractors and uh, team members that we kind of work with all over the world as well. Jeez. So uh, it's been a journey. Um, yeah, I'll say. And like and, uh, to your point, overnight success, right? 21 right. year overnight success. But the fun thing is, you know, I feel like I'm just getting started. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like it's just the beginning right now. I feel yeah. like there's so much more ahead. And that's really exciting to me. Um, this is a hard industry to some extent because it changes so rapidly. Um, mm -hmm. Things that we do now, in some cases, didn't even exist three years ago. You know, three years. That's why colleges have a hard time keeping up with the industry because in most cases, it takes them two or three years to get a curriculum accredited. By that point, the information's already outdated and we're doing something different. Um, right. And so... You know, it's it's been a journey, but at the same time, I, after 21 years, I still feel like I'm just getting started, and I'm excited for what the future holds. Man, it, it's I mean that's a great way of looking at. It. I mean, you've already done a lot. You're already doing a lot. Not, not even just the busy, but just like the, you know, the output is amazing. So to think that like no, I'm just I'm just getting started, and I mean, that's exciting. It's exciting to see what the the future holds. Um, I've got a hypothetical for you. Mm -hmm. I may or may not have a time machine here in Nashua, New Hampshire. And, um, you know, post COVID, you come over, you use it, have a couple of beers and you can use the time machine. It's in the back and there's a tarp over it, squirrels and everything, you know, so <laughs> use that thing. And, uh, but it's particular, it only goes back in time to a particular time. It's about a couple of days after, um, after, I don't know, like graduation. It's like mm -hmm. early when your career is just starting, right? If you can go back in time and talk to that person, that version of you back then, you're just getting started. Maybe it's, you know, after that first 5k deal or maybe even before that, what kind of advice would you give yourself? You can go talk to yourself. Mm. Gosh, that's a hard question. People ask this question, but it's, it's like, what would you tell yourself, you know, when mm -hmm. you're younger? I, I think for me, it's not everybody, right? It's not like telling everybody what to do. It's like right. telling you in particular. It's very what, different at a very yeah. particular age as well. I think at that point I, I would want somebody to tell me, um, kind of what I started the show with, which is look, you don't have to work hundred hours to be successful. You need other people around you and you can't do it alone. And well, you can, but only for so long. And um, you're not as important as you think you are, but you're highly valuable. And I think if somebody, I think I, fortunately I did have a lot of that uh, advice. I think I did have plenty of good people around me, but yeah, but to tell, that's what I would tell myself is you're not as important as you think you are, but you are highly valuable. Um, and you need other people around you. You don't have to do this alone. And when people say things like, you know, if you want it done right, you got to do it yourself. That's garbage. Totally. That is not true. Um, and if it is, you're not a very good leader. Yeah. And if you're hearing that and you're, and you're thinking, oh, my team doesn't execute very well. And I feel like I have to do that well, then you need a better team. Yeah, yeah. It's either the team or it's team. you. <laughs> or you need to grow. But 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 if it's a team, you hired the team. So like, yeah. it's still you, right? It's, it's still, still your it's fault. Still you. <laughs> and so that's the bad news. The bad news is it's your fault. Right. The good news is you're the one who has the opportunity to fix it. Right. And that's what's exciting about it. And but you don't have to fix it alone. So I think that's what I would tell myself in the early years is like you just don't have to go at it alone. It's not. It's people always say it's lonely at the top. You know. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs feel that. Mm -hmm. um, even if they're just running a small solo shop, they feel lonely and um, it doesn't have to be lonely. You can right. have other people around you. And there are people, you know, like you and I who are like, want to help other people in the same business, do the yeah. same thing. I've helped people in my own community build web design businesses that are technically, I guess, competition to us. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I, I don't care about that. Um, I would rather help them and I'd rather help them and not anybody, anybody know about which business I helped. Like, yeah, that's, that's exciting for me. Cause I can stay back and be like, I, I, I'm excited to have had a piece of helping make that happen. Yeah. So. That contribution, it really is way more powerful than people give oh, it credit for sure. And it, there really is, there was plenty, there's plenty of fish in the sea and it, it's all about just going after and getting it. I, I think people are the exciting part too. I mentioned the lonely at the top. I've, I've felt that before, but I also know the opposite of that, which is, man, it can be really fun to work with people who are on top of their game oh, great. and are even better at something than you are. Mm -hmm. And, and they're just in their groove doing what they love. And you're just like, wow. I remember getting off calls with some people just being more excited. And I thought that was an excited guy in the room. Get off a call. I'm like, wow, I'm stoked. Like Kim or whoever I'm talking to you and my team, 
um, you know, like Alex, like, wow, now I'm really pumped. And it's almost like that multiplying effect of talking to somebody else. So it, yeah, I, people are the thing to help get it done, but also can really inspire you to go create more. Absolutely. Love it. You see, I, I, I almost feel bad because the you know, time value of money and the opportunity cost, you could have had a nap just now and had, and had your, <laughs> your, your best breakthrough ever. Maybe this is so exhausted you that you'll go sleep now and, uh, and, and you'll have your, you'll, you'll invent the, um, the time traveling device. Maybe, yeah. but we're moving into a new house right now. So I have a feeling if I went home and went to sleep after my wife being there with five kids all day, that probably would not. <laughs> it's not a good me, play. So not, not a good play nap. right there. Today's not my nap day. That's fine. You know, one other question to ask you on the more philosophical side, and this is, somebody asked me, you know, this is kind of a cool idea. The idea of as a human being, what is it that you would love to be known for or known as? Mm. You know, uh, one of the most difficult exercises that I ever did was uh, from a book called Living Forward, actually mm. by Michael Hyatt, who I mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah. and, and in it, he makes you write your, um, it basically makes you write your obituary, <laughs> which is actually gotcha. a Stephen, Stephen Covey thing. Stephen uh, Covey in one of his books does something kind of like that too. And uh, one of the things that he makes you do as a result of that is, write down the 10 most important people or groups of people in your life. Hmm. And then he has you write a paragraph that each person would say about you at your funeral in a best case scenario. What would you want that person to say about you? And so I think that the answer of what I want to be known for um, varies depending on who I want to be known by. Yeah, that's a good and point. And so, you know, in that document, I, I, sat down and did this exercise, which is a very emotional thing to do, actually. When you sit down and write down what you would want your wife to say about you mm. at your funeral, whew, when you sit down and write what you would want your children to stand up and say about you at your funeral, yeah, I mean, tough. one of the, uh, uh, we won't get into politics, but one of the things I uh, loved about George W. was watching him speak at his father's funeral. Mm, and there was that. a guy who was a president of the United States, the most power, one of the most powerful people in the world, talking about his dad, who was a president of the United States. <laughs> right. And all he really did was talk about what a great daddy was. No kidding. And you should go watch it. It's a powerful eulogy. And, and so I think that to answer your question- No, hold on real really quick. Could, so it wasn't like any accomplishments. It, it was the dad accomplishments. That was, yeah. It, you know, I was going to say, bring yeah. up that, it actually matters. This is a great twist on this. It actually matters who's saying it because right. your, your wife and your children and your friends and your family and your coworkers are all saying like, wow, he was a great entrepreneur. You know, I almost think of like the Steve Jobs thing and hopefully he had different people with different experiences. Sure. But if everyone's thing is like kind of an asshole, but we have the iPhone, thank goodness. Right. Like that, that's, that's, that can be a problem. Hopefully he has different stories from the other people that loved him, but you're right. You, you don't want everyone saying the same thing. Right. And not, not to harp on Elon, because I don't know him personally, but sure. like, I mean, the guys right now, the, one of the greatest inventive minds that is totally. on the planet. No question about it. Totally. Tesla, the boring company, SpaceX. I don't even, he's got like a whole bunch of other things. That all these, I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> used to be PayPal. I mean, who is this guy? You know? Seriously. But I wouldn't trade that for the relationship with my five children. True. I wouldn't trade that for my 20 years of marriage. I would not trade a multi-billion dollar uh, worth for those things. I mm -hmm. wouldn't do it. And so like, ultimately, I wanna be known for a lot of things. I wanna be known uh, as a guy who loved his wife well, uh, imperfectly, heavily imperfectly. I wanna know as a guy yeah. who was a great father. I wanna be known as a guy who cared well for his team and clients and grew a profitable business at the same time. I wanna be known as a guy who loved Jesus and, and was comfortable talking about his faith uh, in front of whoever would listen. But sure. at the same time was, was comforting and welcoming to anybody around him. Uh, yeah. Because you know, regardless of what I believe, like I, I wanna be in company with all kinds of people. Right. And, and I, ultimately, like if I say I believe in Jesus, that's what he did. Like when yeah. Jesus, there's a story in the Bible where Jesus was talking uh, to a guy named Zacchaeus. A lot of people have heard this story. If they grew up in church, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee he's a short guy? Short, short guy, Short right? guy. He's a tax yeah. collector. And uh, he was sitting up in a tree so he could see Jesus coming down the street. And Jesus said, hey, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. And 
we read that story now and we think, well, I don't know what the big deal is. So he went to the, he went to the, uh, you know, house of a tax collector. Like I know a couple of guys who are in government and nobody really likes taxes, but whatever. They're not, yeah. They're not bad. <laughs> but back then we don't know the context of that story. Back then Zacchaeus was a horrible guy. Like he yeah. was a thief. He was, he was a crony for the, for the Roman government. Um, the Jews hated these people. He, they were horrible to them. Like mm -hmm. it was an atrocious relationship. And yet he was willing to go, you know what? Hey, let's go, let's go get some food because there's so much value in that relationship. And so uh, that's a long answer to your question as most of my answers usually are. But I think that when you, when you ask the question, who, who, what do you want to be known for? The ultimate answer is who do I want to be known by? Yeah. And, and what they say um, ultimately is what legacy is. And, you know, I'm only 38 years old and God willing, I got a lot more years left on the planet, but I think all of us, especially this year is a reminder of that. We should live in a space where we're not promised another minute. We're not yeah. promised another day. And so what are we going to do with today? Um, and we spend so much time worried about tomorrow. And I think we should plan. We should be prepared. We've talked about intentionality, yeah. but at the same time, what am I going to do with today? What does that mm -hmm. look like? When somebody brings something hard to me, what am I going to do with that? I just posted earlier on Facebook um, that 2020, provides an incredible opportunity for us uh, because many of us have been through uh, some of the most stressful seasons we've ever been. Some people with some serious health crises, yeah. some people with some serious job crisis, serious financial crisis, and overall just fear. Like there's so much fear right now. Mm -hmm. But the opportunity that we have as leaders, as entrepreneurs, as husbands, as fathers, as people in our communities, the, the opportunity that we have right now is to, is to decide how we're going to respond in this season. And I think how we respond in seasons of great stress and great overwhelm are the things that people will remember the most. And so we should be very careful about how we choose to respond uh, in the midst of great stress. Dang, you're a cool guy. I'll see you in I'll see you in St. Augustine in March. Let's get rid of this awesome, man. So we can hang out. Let's do it. Um, where can people connect with you? What social sites, um, yeah. URLs, throw out some good stuff. I'm on all the things. So wherever you, you know, <laughs> want to be there, you can just look for me. But if you just want to find a single resource, the best place to go is my personal website, which is jowenlive.com. That's J A Y O W E N live.com. All the things are on there, links to my social accounts, link to the podcast, link to my book, links to my agency, all that kind of stuff. And, and we're, we're going to be all launching some really exciting new things later this year and, and certainly into 2021 around coaching and consulting that's going to tie really nicely together with the agency that we already provide. So I'm super excited about where we're going. And that's kind of the hub uh, where you can find any of that. Also, if you want to go on there, some just kind of a free thing that you can sign up for. I have a 52-week email series where every week I just send you one email, not an email every five minutes, just one email. Right, right. And in that email, I share a practical tip that's helped me grow my business. Some of them are videos, some of them are text. People learn different ways. So you can go on to joandlive.com, sign up for that weekly wisdom uh, email, and you'll get one email a week from me with just free business growth ideas I'd love to share with you. Yeah, this is great, man. And I see there's, there's you know, you got plenty of resources, the podcast, you've got free marketing assessment, get the book for free, like all sorts of good stuff on there. Yes, sir. And the design is on point, my friend. You've got Thanks. some artistic skills with you and your team there at work. I have some great team members for sure. I didn't do a whole lot of it. I just provide the vision of where we're going and they, they uh, execute on it. Absolutely, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on here. What a, what a pleasure, especially this is the first one. This is podcast number one. I don't know how often we get a chance to, to be on the inaugural awesome. episode. I like being on the first the one. And man, today, I don't know. I, was, I guess I'm in an emotional state today. I just feel like I went on all kind of uh, random rant. Great. So I might need to steal this uh, copy from you and use it for some other stuff to Absolutely, share with you. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And then we'll have to have you come back on here in a little bit and catch up with you in the winter or something yeah, like post that. post-COVID for sure. Yeah, yeah. And then especially as that event gets closer, you know. Yeah, I'd love sure. to. Of course, I'm already sold. So save Great. me a, save me a I love spot. It. Um, and hey, for those people listening, if you learn something, and I freaking know you did because I ran out of paper. I've got a, two sides of paper over here, front and back, and they are full. I got, I got no room. So I learned just a few things here on this combo. If, if that's the case, share this with someone. Be a thought leader. LinkedIn's great for that. But, but put what, you know, not just link to the episode, put what you learned. What was your takeaway? Just one thing that you got from this tag Jay on it, tag myself, start a conversation. That's thought leadership. And Jay, again, awesome, man. It was great meeting you. You're, you're a great dude. Um, great hanging out. Appreciate it.
Thanks, Chris. Right. Yeah, man. And for those people listening, this is Agencies That Build. We will catch you all next time.